Good morning. Happy New Year to you all. Today, we are on the Human Results Podcast with our legend of the HR world, Mr. Alistair Hobbs. Happy New Year, Alistair. How are you? Happy New Year, Ben. Yes, uh, very well, thank you. Um, working from home as much as I can, obviously, in the light of, uh, of the latest national lockdown. We would like to be talking about HR policies, but unfortunately, we're still at two points of where we have been for the last, well, it seems like five years now, Brexit and coronavirus. We're in another lockdown as we speak. So let's start with the obvious. How are things on the HR world after the lockdown announcement? Well, I mean, obviously, Ben, there's clients who are, um, have had queries this week um, on this issue. Um, a lot have been uh, quite familiar with the, the, the terms of the scheme. Um, some just wanted some refreshers. What we are inevitably seeing, of course, is in some cases we have uh, employers with staff who uh, have got problems with childcare, back to homeschooling in some cases, back to uh, problems with uh, with internet connectivity and uh, lack of equipment, kids in some cases with, with specialist learning difficulties who are not getting as much or they're not in the school environment so you know parents are having to be around to help so yes it's putting the inevitable pressures on home life and on business so we're seeing a bit of that a bit of that yes there's been a number of examples this week with parents um, of children asking asking their employers can they be furloughed yet the answer is yes uh, the employer can furlough uh, but the guidance does not say that employers must furlough. It is still very much the employer's discretion, and it's going to depend hugely on the nature of, of, of the business. I mean, most companies with, with employees able to work effectively from home are probably in the service sector, or their central services supporting their own businesses. So, you know, they, they, the account staff, in a manufacturing company, they might have the ability to dial in and access systems and things, so they can work from home. Of course, they still have all those pressures, all those problems with childcare and homeschool, etc. But I think that a lot of employers, they were able to make it work comparatively well last time round. You know, and, and indeed, we say last time round, a lot of employers have continued throughout the summer and into the autumn with, with staff working largely from home, maybe on a road to those I'm going in. So I think it's better this time round in that regard. A lot of the pain of the early sudden lockdown that, that businesses experienced at the, at the end of March and into April last year, they've, uh, they've, they've adapted and uh, they've found a way of making it work. So it's not been as bad this time round, Ben. But yes, it's got its individual problems. There are people with, with kids who are uh, finding it difficult. And obviously, if you're a manufacturing business and your staff member who's asking you happens to be a production line worker, well, they can't work from home, can they? No. Um, can you furlough them? Well, that just depends on your resources, your order book, profitability. And as a matter of policy... The difficulty is you give to one and you've got a queue outside your door. So you have to you have to balance uh, convenience with with, with, with with operational need. It is tough. But we, we, we're having those conversations. We've been having those conversations all week. You know, with, with, with clients, we've come up with a few alternative solutions. Maybe a, an, empl an employee has asked for furlough, but after discussions... And looking at it, they've actually changed their hours of work. They're coming in earlier and leaving earlier, going part-time in effect. Works out not too far off the kind of 80% they might have got on furlough. But they're able to spend pretty much all afternoon helping to support the home environment where, you know, there are there are some, some complexities. So talk it through with, uh, talk it through with your advisors, talk it through with your staff. Looked, look for solutions um, rather than just say, no, they might exist. Generally, it's worked out better this time round. But I was reading an art somewhere on Facebook. Somebody asked a question on a forum, and I'd like to put this to you. They've clearly seen that person has broken COVID rules away from the workplace. 
what do they do then? Can they furlough that person? Can, is it a disciplinary issue? What is the situation? They, they were asking for advice. What's the situation there? Yeah, that's a difficult one, Ben. I mean, the fact is, if somebody is putting themselves at unnecessary risk, it can, of course, have a, a potentially devastating effect on the workplace if somebody was to bring that in. But how, how do you establish the causal link between one site of somebody in breach with them actually catching it at that occasion and bringing it into the workplace? I, I mean, we, we certainly all, all last uh, year, once lockdown eased, there's been examples of employers reiterating the importance of, of social distancing and following the rules and the impact on the workplace. I've yet to see a dismissal for breaches if it's outside of work time in somebody's private life. Uh, employers, I think, have tended to not take that one on. That is a risk. But you know, if it's a criminal activity, in effect, then you can bring the employer into disrepute uh, and and therefore normal rules of discipline could potentially apply if you've been hosting a christmas you know new year's eve rave with with 2000 participants and the, and the, and the press are there well you can imagine the huge damage to an employer's reputation potentially if they were implicated with somebody uh, involved in that but draw the analogy of the time when the england supporter with a with a his face painted with a with the uh, flag of saint george's on the front page of the tabloids connected to you know football violence at European Championships or something like that. And Tony Blair, didn't he, demanded, demand, he said, if I was that person's employer, they should sack him. Well, he was a post office worker and they did. Yeah. But then, but then, but he succeeded in the employment tribunal because actually they 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 hadn't done their investigation. I mean, all he was doing was pulling a face in front of a camera. I mean, he had no evidence of him being a, a hooligan. Yes, yeah. so, yes, yes. Yeah. 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 It, is, yeah. it is, of course. And it, it also, I mean, these days with social media, of course, it, it, it can be seen to look a lot different than that than the case actually is. Well, quite, uh, quite. You see, that you, sometimes you see these photographs and you can't help but pass comment and actually you then get shown a different angle and what looks like a packed out beach at, uh, at Bournemouth or something might actually be quite relaxed and spaced out, you know, so I, I know. We, I think we're both aware that we've not come to the real nooks and, uh, you know, the crunch time of coronavirus. I think that's going to end when, when all the, the, the government schemes end. I think that's when the, the, the real... Oh, absolutely, Ben. We're back into this uh, artificial period. We've had clear guidance uh, this week, just reiterating where we were before. But, you know, anybody who's uh, who's who's previously had to shield because of health issues or if they've got people in their house, in that situation, then you know they're, they're they're eligible to be furloughed. Um, if you've got childcare, basically, if your life is adversely affected by COVID nineteen, you're probably going to be fine. Arguing successfully that you you should be furloughed if the employer can 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 do that. Come the end of April, whether we see any staggering reduction before that i i don't know ben because obviously we we can't see any real opening up until after february half term maybe for the schools that would obviously make a huge difference to the economy as well if uh, kids go back to school and people are able to who can work are able to work that's going to make a big difference be no mention of of phasing out or reducing furlough just yet and I'd uh, be interested to see what uh, further further developments there are. Everybody's pinning their hopes on a vaccine now, aren't they? Uh, being pumped out. And of course, we are we are in cold uh, cold and flu season. So I think the guidance is uh, if you have cold and flu symptoms, still go and get a test just to make sure it's not. Uh, but we don't actually close down offices and things until it is proven it's COVID. I think, isn't it? In, in that respect. That's right. That's right. Although I was interested to see yesterday, Telford and Rekin uh, Council, for example, locally, they have um, want people without symptoms to go for a, a voluntary tests, which I must say, I mean, I, I don't really necessarily want to go driving around to a testing centre if I didn't think there was a chance that I, or a reasonable chance that I actually had it and was displaying some symptoms because I wouldn't want to bump into somebody who did have a few symptoms. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. Like, yeah. 
is. So, uh, but but so it's inter but it's interesting to see that they're that they're wanting people to come forward. Obviously, they 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 reckon up to thirty percent or so of people carrying the the virus are asymptomatic. So it is. Well, as I say, we are where we are. We have been here now for the last nine ten months. But um, it's been extraordinary. Um, as for Brexit, Ben, well, it's um, <laughs> how, did you, how did you know I was going to well, mention that? <laughs> there you are. You know, we can speculate what's going to happen next in terms of uh, in terms of, of of change. Obviously, the big thing for for, for businesses right now: immigration and work permits. Uh, if you've got EU nationals working for you, if they were with you before the thirty first of December then fine you've got until june i think uh, for, for them to to make sure that they've got you know registered as uh, as a settled status here if you have got that situation and and there's plenty you do obviously i mean there's been a big actual increase in immigration um in the last year or two i think post uh, referendum i think uh, numbers went up if anything last year important contribution that they make so but yeah i think employers just need to make sure that they've got that paperwork and they can help employees with it if needs be that's the first thing as for the other things at the moment well we'll see we're starting from the same place uh, as everybody else in terms of eu law um, I can speculate on things that might change, but I think well, let's uh, let's see. I'd be interested to see. I think areas around agency work and working time is another one. Those are two couple of areas where EU uh, and UK interpretation might start to diverge a little bit. Don't wish to speculate. There's no immediate big change on the horizon that I've seen just yet i mean at the moment we're just seeing the seeing where the extra friction at the borders are and um depending on which side of the political fence you are you make more of it in some cases and less less of in others there is clearly a lot of new bureaucracy around um sources of origin and um products and and, and things like that there's quite a lot more paperwork there's a bit more you know vat paperwork and things like that so it is causing friction ben no doubt it was expected what were people expecting yeah yeah but um, it's, it's certainly not the scale of what happened three or four days before christmas though with the, the lorry parks being set up it's certainly not no, that scale. i think we're um no and uh let's see how things pan out and i i think there's going to be a lot of disruption uh as there's increased footfall increased lorries i mean we're we're only in that um, first proper week in January, so I don't know. We'll we'll see, but it's not been headline news that much, is it? No, um, no, overshadowed, of course, by the factors. I, I think it has been. We'll it see. Has. It has. Yeah. The biggest question, I'm sure, all the listeners are, are trying to gauge now is: We do that legal update now. What you and know, we can actually do the legal update because things just change weekly, don't they? Still, it's just difficult. We can certainly uh, do a recap on um, on where things have been uh, in the last year, Ben. I mean, I think as far as going forward is concerned, I mean, pushing aside you know, Brexit, the one thing that's been on the horizon for quite some time now is um, is IR35, um, changes around how HMRC will view status, the increased risk, the risk of, of liability for, for tax falling on the end user employer, if you like, rather than the maybe the small, um, the small uh, limited company that engages the, the contractor the, through you know, with the employer. So I think we can certainly have a look at that. That's on the horizon for April, uh, coming into force in the next financial year. I just want to yeah. ask you about R35. Is it a standard setup for most or is it an individual contract for all? So the, the, the agreements that you have with your, I suppose, suppliers, the product you could be selling is yourself uh, is it a standard contract where it's the agreements are a, a standard or is it going to be individual depending on the agreements between the two businesses it's going to be an individual contract i mean i think if you're a, if you're a contractor who's engaging with more than one uh end user for your services then, and the more of those end users there might be the more classically business to business that that's going to be but under the new rules i mean the organizers engaging a contractor is they're, they're the ones was responsible for determining 
employment status going forward and assessing whether or not IR35 applies. So if you as a contract, if you as a as an organization, let's take a common example. Um, you're a building contractor. You, you maybe have a, a very settled workforce, um, but that workforce is a combination of of subcontractors operating directly through, uh, directly with you. As as workers, though, you might have historically always taken tax and NI, uh, but then again, that worker might have uh, might have ganged up with two or three others, and they might have their own van, their own tools. Mm. They might operate in gangs and come in gangs, or some of those gangs are limited companies, three or four in them. So you've got to sit down and think, well, I have to assess now. I'm liable if I don't get this right. I have to assess, is that gang of gang of four who are all effectively operating as a single unit, are they, are they all individual? Am I paying them individually? Usually, often, the case is yes. So I think you just have to work through the new rules and uh, pay the individual fees deemed, you know, for that, for tax and NI purposes, review those contracts. You, you've been studying R35 for a fair while now, so people get in touch with you for, for advice and, and how to move yes. forward, can't they? We can, Ben. We have a look. HMRC have got a data uh, formula on the on their website, but you, you of course, appreciate that uh, their game are not poacher. So you, um, you go through the government's own tick list press the button to say is this an is this a is this going to be caught well you know it's going to fall on the side of uh, of the tax man if you did that they're probably not far off yeah right. i'm not gonna i'm not going to uh, suggest that the tax man is doing anything other than making sure that uh, they get they get what there's what they're due yeah and, course, and nothing more yeah, of course they are. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so so we'll we'll have to go deep into our thirty five as, as we get closer to April. That's yeah. just a brief brief overview now. And the key is now take your voice now, get the cost that it's going to do to put it in place, so it's not a big shock in April when, of course, all the tax bills are due as well. Do get Alice's advice from you know in January and February rather than last minute because there will be a few on there. Yeah, I think that um, yeah, just I'm just thinking about what other changes there might particularly be, Ben. I mean, there was uh, there was some consultation about extending. Uh, you might remember this; it was the national news, but talk of extension of um, of maternity rights for for returning returning parents to work, um, and and extending that right to uh, to um, in relation to redundancy give an extra six months protection effectively so that employees coming back from periods of maternity are not finding themselves um, quickly made redundant once they're outside of that statutory protection period. I think the problem is a lot of businesses will make do or find other ways of doing things while somebody's been on maternity because it's quite a lengthy period of time. Businesses have to move on. So inevitably, uh, it's been the case that um, that sometimes employees have, have, have found themselves made redundant fairly quickly after a term, yeah. especially if they've sought or or, or or they've been turned down for things like flexible working requests, uh, sometimes arguably in bad faith. So there, there there's possibly some changes on, on the on the way uh, in relation to that extension of that protection period otherwise we're just again totally dominated by um by the current crisis that we are in i think you're right and i think that that's the, the, the point is that what we don't want now is things just to be chucked at us uh, because of all the delays we've had through coronavirus and brexit we still need a steady uh, update for well, everything coming to us businesses need to know don't we i mean yeah. und- undoubtedly the decision to extend the furlough scheme further uh, was taken at a time uh, in the autumn where a lot of people uh, had already lost their jobs in certain sectors because of the increased cost to the employer whilst they hadn't seen the pickup in business or they were affected like the hospitality industry especially uh, affected by the fact that they couldn't open or they or they were under such such restrictions um, that they just could not um, make make businesses viable. So yeah, we definitely saw redundancies um, from August last year, really, until until the Chancellor announced the extension of the scheme. And certainly now, again, it's 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 settled down for a bit longer. 
just to finish off the podcast, obviously that brings us to a, a pertinent point. Hearings, um, what's the situation? Are they back via Zoom? Are they in person still? I, I, how's the judicial guidance has been that uh, that uh, in, in hearings should be should be online remotely unless it's in the interests of justice. Now that's an interesting concept, but unless it's in the interests of justice to hold host or to to have it in person. Now practically. Uh, that's going to depend on the facts, but uh, the obvious one might be, does one of the parties have a, uh, some sort of disability, whether that's personal or just their circumstances, you know, let's face it, if you lived in Ironbridge at the moment, and you had to conduct a video tribunal hearing, likely it is, you won't, yeah. because yeah. you'll have, you'll be, you'll be just lucky to have the broad bandwidth to conduct a hearing. With um, the weather, the weather as well, of course, is going to affect that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, it, you know, you couldn't, you know, you couldn't reasonably. I think you would have to apply to an to, to the tribunal and say it's not in the interest of justice. I cannot conduct this like this. Similarly, though, there might be some um, need for reasonable adjustments uh, because of somebody's own circumstances um, about something that requires um, a bit more care in, in how to deliver it. But yes, yeah, certainly the, the expectation is, is that for the foreseeable future, whilst we're in lockdown, hearings really ought to be uh, remote. Interestingly, before Christmas, though, uh, even in areas like Bristol, which was tier four at the time, parties had to attend a hearing I had just before Christmas, notwithstanding the fact that um, you know, it, was, it was tier four. Um, the, the judge said, no, we are special dispensation. A week or two later, though, I think they'd have to say, yes, it wouldn't be appropriate. We should switch it to, uh, to video conference. Now, as always, a very important update to the world. Please do contact Alistair uh, at Yuma Results. Uh, he will give you the best advice around. So for this podcast, we hope that we can bring you some more positive news about things progressing over the next couple of weeks. Alistair, for today, that's brilliant. Thank you, Ben.